Hello. Um, so um, this week we're going to be looking at chapter 11, uh, which deals with heroines, um, specifically with the heroine uh, known as Medea. So the book starts, uh, or the chapter starts, Maritia starts by basically taking the five point things she had for heroes, right? A person who has to be dead, there has to be a shrine to them, they have to have done extraordinary things, those may or may not be moral, that sort of thing. And basically just says the same, that same list applies to heroines. I agree, that's, you know, they're, they're going to have a shrine generally, so it's going to be like a hero. Um, and of course they have to be dead to have a shrine and all that. But I think maybe a better way of looking at heroines is um, the scheme that Harris, Stephen Harris and Gloria Platzner, um, who were the authors of a myth book that I used to use, um, had, and that is the following. So there, there are five types of heroines, according to Harris and Platzner. Um, the, the first two are approved paths. To some, to some extent, uh, four and five are two. Three is sort of the um, outlier. Um, so you've got the wife or the mother of the hero. So this would apply to Alcmena, the mother of uh, Heracles, or uh, Andromache, the wife of Hector in the Iliad. Those, they would apply. So those are the approved paths for women in ancient Greece. And so they're the approved paths for uh, women as heroines, right? And they're, of course, noble um, women, right? They're women who um, are able to uh, you know, be married to someone like the hero um, and, and be a good wife or be a good mother. The, they can be the assistant to hero. This is usually a young woman. Uh, she's still a virgin. And the way Harrison Platzner put it, things are fine for the assistant to the hero, provided the assistant of the hero doesn't fall in love with the hero and does ultimately end up on a path to um, to marriage. Uh, uh, an example of this would be Electra, the sister of Orestes. She helps him out, um, but then she marries uh, Pylades, um, uh, Orestes' friend, um, and presumably they live happily ever after. So again, it's okay for her to sort of sow her wild oats as a sidekick, but then uh, she has to settle down. Number three, the outlier, the hero impersonator. This is a heroine who acts like a hero. So in literature, the best figure I can think of is Lady Macbeth in the play Macbeth. She's really the driving force in the action. She's the one who actually, quote unquote, acts like a man. I mean, she acts certainly more forcefully than her husband Macbeth does. Um, the uh, uh, Clytemnestra who kills her husband uh, in the Agamemnon would be another example. Medea is an example. Medea starts as the assistant to the hero, but she falls in love with the hero. Um, in fact, that's why she becomes the assistant to the hero. And then in her later life, she, uh, she basically decides she's going to be in it for herself. Um, and you, you see the result in the Medea. That, this is not an approved path. But it is the closest to the male hero. So it is with the good reason that uh, after she dies, um, uh, Medea ends up married sort of in the afterlife or on the, the Isle of the Blessed to Achilles. Um, that makes a whole lot of sense because they're, they're very much alike. Um, number four, the Bride of Death would apply to Iphigenia and to a heroine called Antigone. From Sophocles play Antigone. These are young women who die before they're married and usually choose death. So in some versions of the Iphigenia story she chooses to be that human sacrifice to help the Greek cause. That makes her a heroic figure. She gives up the one thing of hers, right, her reproductive qualities that make her sort of valuable but she does it for the community. The victorious heroine uh, would be a figure like Penelope in the Odyssey. Um, she is the wife of a hero, Odysseus, but she also sort of has to deal with life uh, on her own terms. But she does it in a way that is unlike the hero impersonator in that she doesn't sort of threaten uh, patriarchy 
um, but works that are within patriarchy to, to make her own way. So I think that that approach is perhaps better. Now, um, the, the literary thing we have from the Greek, Greek literature is Euripides' Medea. That play was produced uh, in 431. Um, in that, uh, that, if, that year, you, we know that Euripides came in third place. So he, he was chosen to be in the festival, but basically he lost, right? He didn't get first prize, he didn't get second prize, he got third place. Um, which, you know, if there are only three, that's basically the loser uh, position. Um, Medea is perhaps Euripides' best known play, and it is a play of his that gets uh, uh, performed a lot. Um, the, the book has a section from the play, um, it's about maybe a third of the way into the play, uh, called the uh, Agon uh, scene. So Agon, which just means contest, is here used as a word for debate. Now, what's important to know is that Euripides lived at a time in Athenian democracy when these guys called um, uh, sof sophists um, were basically running school in Athens. Now, the sophists were, uh, they were non-Athenians, but what the, the skill that they taught was they taught how you could make a good speech. Now, keep in mind, Athens is a democracy. Who's going to have power in a democracy? It's the person who can make his, in this case it would always be his, his case the best to the people, right? The one who can be most persuasive is going to get things done. So uh, you can see why rhetorical training, learning how to make speeches, would be so important for the Athenians. The problem is the sophists were seen not as providing true wisdom, they were seen as providing the skill set so that you could basically lie well. So they were sort of seen as spinmeisters. So in this debate, and, and Euripides has a debate scene in almost every one of his plays, in this debate scene, Medea is very emotional, but what she says is largely true, maybe entirely true, whereas um, Jason sounds really good. I mean, he, he's able to put together, uh, you know, a seeming argument that sounds very good, but it's basically a lie, or to believe it, we have to believe what he says, and we only have his word on it. We don't have in, in sort of independent. So Medea is basically talking about stuff that's verifiable, and Jason is not. So here we've got the case, Jason, I would argue, is the loser in the debate, in the debate scene itself, because uh, even though he makes a, uh, an argument that sounds nice, uh, it's basically fabricated and therefore um, would not win because it, he doesn't have the evidence to support what he says. Um, and Euripides is very opposed to this rhetorical training. I mean, he, he's, he's a, you know, a sort of an old-fashioned guy, and he really sort of hates that. Okay, so the scholarship looks at um, the work of a woman named Marianne Jezevsky. And what Marianne Jezevsky did was she took the um, Lord Raglan, a uh, British scholar, um, compiled a list of heroic qualities. And I forget how many there were. I think there were 21. It might have been a, a, more than that. And she sort of whittles that down to 18 qualities that also apply to the heroine. So uh, it's similar to what we had with prop. It's a you know, sort of structural sort of argument um, looking at, but here's looking at the hero, not necessarily the story. The, um, the comparison thing is pretty straightforward. It is a selection from Ovid's Metamorphoses um, about Medea. Now, Ovid was a Roman poet. He wrote an epic poem called the Metamorphoses. This is a collection of stories about changes. So things happen in each of these stories that he tells where someone changes their form. Um, the Medea part doesn't seem to have much of a change, although uh, Medea does, um, is able to uh, like cut someone up, boil them in water with sp special herbs, and the person then rises out of the boiling broth uh, rejuvenated. They're, they're, they're young again. Um, she does this for Jason's father, uh, for instance. Um, 
that perhaps it would be, the, I mean, there's a change there, obviously, between someone who's old to someone who's young, between someone who, you know, if they're chopped up, are dead, to someone who's living. But um, I, otherwise, I don't really see the change in this particular story. Now, the thing about Ovid is Ovid also wrote a play about Medea, and ancient scholars say that that was his best work, that was the best thing he ever did. That work has not survived, which is somewhat surprising, because we have a lot of Ovid. Uh, we we have almost everything Ovid wrote, but we don't have this play, Medea, that he wrote. And presumably that play is very similar to Euripides. It deals with the Medea in Corinth. It deals with this uh, uh, situation um, where she is going to get exiled, and she takes revenge against the king and the princess and her husband um, for, for how they treat her. That presumably is the same plot. Now, in the Metamorphoses section, we get the stuff around that. We don't really get that. And, and, I'm, and part of me thinks that the reason is Ovid already wrote about that and Euripides wrote about that. So Ovid decides he's not going to spend time on that. He's going he's to do the stuff around it. Um, so, but it's a slightly different ver, you know, way of looking at Medea, uh, in part because the Romans, of course, look at strong emotion as being something dangerous, right? So they're, they're, they're you know, you want to keep that in check is the thing for the Romans. All right. And then the, the uh, comparison section or the, the Nachleben section deals with the story an act of an actual person, uh, Peggy Garner. She was a runaway slave uh, who fled the South. Um, uh, I think fled from Kentucky. She fled into Ohio. Um, Southern Ohio, of course, Cincinnati is just across the, uh, the river, the Ohio River from Kentucky. She makes it there. Um, the fugitive slave law compelled the free states to actually track down or to allow trackers to track down runaway slaves and recapture them and bring them back. Um, and what Peggy Garner does is when she is uh, confronted, she kills her daughter. Um, and uh, I think tries to kill, I think she has a son too, she tries to kill a son, is unsuccessful uh, in, in doing that because she stopped uh, and then she's arrested. And at the time, they were comparing her story to Medea, which is sort of an interesting thing because like Medea, she is seen as a foreigner, right? An outsider, she's not a citizen of the United States. Um, just like Medea, uh, and she kills her kids. So there, there's the similarity, of course, the reason she likely killed the kid was because it was a girl that she killed was she did not want her child to be raped by the master which almost certainly would have happened at some point so th so this seems to be on the part of peggy garner actually a mercy killing uh and you know medea's killing of her kids seems to be just to get revenge of jason um although i mean she's not crazy about killing her kids it's not like whoa i get to do this uh but you know, she's willing to do that to get revenge. Whereas I think Peggy Garner does it in a sense to save her daughter from something uh, worse than death. And um, this story, by the way, serves as the basis for Toni Morrison's novel, Beloved. Um, and in that story, Beloved is the ghost of the child that the, the, the main female character um, killed. Um, in this case, I think it was so that they could they could escape like the, there was the the kid in some way was keeping them from escaping and so um, rather than be recaptured and have have the child uh, recaptured and enslaved and of course presumably raped um, you know the the mother figure kills it but the ghost haunts uh, the mother and that that so it's a ghost story um, and I heartily recommend it Toni Morrison is a great author uh, she deserves a Nobel Prize that she got. So that's it for this week. Um, we'll see you next time. We'll be moving on to chapter 12.